Hi. Today I want to tell you a little bit about the history of probability and statistics. This is not because this is a course about history, but simply it would really help you before we start working on the details and the mathematics uh, of doing probability, it would help you to know what is the general framework and what are the kind of questions that people ask in statistics. And it turns out that it's a very diverse set of questions. So it's helpful to know from the get-go about these different types of questions. So um, in general, you can say that statistics and probability in its modern form started around 1650. Um, but the types of questions that have been asked um, the, uh, fall into two groups in general, and uh, one is um, repeated games of chance, and the other is um, strength of evidence and degrees of belief. Okay, so this is a kind of diagram uh, that, that shows um, many of the things that happened during history in these two uh, threads, but, and we're going to look at this diagram more in a future video, but uh, now we're going to just start looking at, the, at some of the major uh, components. And um, to remind you again, there is a red component, which is games of chance, and there is this blue component, which is about degrees of belief. Okay, so games of chance. Games of chance have existed for a very, very long time, um, much before the 1600, probably from before uh, Christ. Um, and the earliest kind of um, games were based on what was called knuckle bones or talis. Uh, so those are bones that are taken from goats and uh, they were used to play uh, games. And the important thing about these games is that they were played many times, one after the other, okay? So here are some uh, images um, of the uh, people playing uh, with uh, knuckle bones. And uh, here is a picture of what the basic knuckle bone game is. Uh, this is the strange shape of the knuckle bone. And depending, you throw it in the air, it falls. And depending on the size on which it falls, uh, you get different amounts of uh, points. Okay, so this is the ancient game of uh, uh, knuckle bones. Um, so, of course, today we have many different types of uh, games of chance. We have dice, we have the roulette, we have uh, cards, we have uh, coins that we flip. Um, and in general, before um, any probability was known, this was kind of seen as a way to um, check your luck or to see what God is trying to tell you. Um, and the simplest assumption when you play uh, these games is the equal probability assumption. So if you have in uh, dice six sides, then each side has a probability of one six. Or if you have a coin, each side has probability a half, and so on. So you just assume, because of the design of the thing that you're playing with, that all of the outcomes have the same probability. And that's the simplest uh, setting of probability, and we're going to work with that quite a lot, okay? But it doesn't always hold, so it's true for dice uh, and roulette, but it is actually not true for knuckle bones, because knuckle bones are asymmetric, and so the probability that they fall on different sides is not the same. So then, in that case, what is it that we um, how, what does it mean that we say that the knuckle bone has different probabilities for different outcomes? So um, the probability, as I said, of a knuckle bone to land on a narrow face is smaller than to land on a wide face. So each knuckle bone is different, and so the probabilities are going to be different. But let's just assume for now that the probability of the four sides is, as it says here, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4. Okay, so those are the probabilities of the four possible outcomes, each one with the number of points that you get. So what we can do, and you can download that notebook, is we can simulate 
flipping the knuckle bone uh, many times and seeing what comes out. So let's flip it 1,000 times. And uh, here we have the, the sequence of 1,000 outcomes. And at the bottom here, we have how many times we got each, each one of the outcomes. So 105, 197. When we normalize it according to the to the to um, to these to to the number of total coins that we found, we get 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.29, and 0 0.41, which are really very very close to these probabilities we started with. So that's what we call long-term frequencies. Long-term frequencies are basically the assumption that when you throw something many 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 times, you the frequency, the number of times that you get each possible outcome, the fraction of that from the total converges to some fixed number. But of course, that depends on how many times you throw the coin, okay, or the knuckle bone in this case. So if we throw it 100 times, that's much fewer, and now the fractions that we get are, are more distant from the true probabilities. And if we throw it just uh, 10 times, then, for instance, the outcome 3 here that has probability 0 0.3 actually didn't happen at all. So we got zero, okay? So if you repeat uh, this kind of game just a small number of times, you don't get what, uh, you don't get anything related to the probabilities. But on the long term, you get the long term probabilities. Okay, so, um, so these are the, the kind of um, questions that, um, you can ask about probabilities, and the typical one that was asked in this uh, famous letter from Pascal to Fermat in, 19, in 1654 is the following. Suppose that we have a game that is just pure chance. Basically, um, we, we have a game of cards, but there's nothing of, uh, that, that is in it that, is, um, that, that helps you if you are talented in this game. It's just pure chance. And um, the game is played until one of the sides wins, okay? And both sides put in one dollar, and the winner takes the two dollars. So suppose now that the game is stopped before one of the sides w wins, and they just have to stop it and go their separate ways. So how much money should each one of them take? That's really the question. And so to, to answer this question, you want to say, Given the cards that player one has, what is the probability that player one would win at the end? Okay, so that was the question that um, uh, Pascal uh, solved for some cases and sent in a letter to Fermat. And that is a classical question that is about games of chance, frequencies, and probabilities. So that's the frequentist point of view. And it basically says the only thing that probability means is that when you repeat the same, the same game or the same um, trial many, many times uh, on many, many people or many, many cases, then what you get converges to the probabilities. That's what probabilities mean. And this gives you a foundation on which most of the mathematics of probability theory can be built. And it makes sense in games and other situations, like polling, but it doesn't always make sense, right? So sometimes it really does not make sense to think about probability as something that is the result of repeating the same game many times. So here are some examples. So suppose a meteorologist says that the probability of rain tomorrow is 10%. What does it mean? It will either rain tomorrow or not rain tomorrow. And tomorrow is going to happen just one time. You can't repeat tomorrow more than one time. So um, you can't really think about this probability of 10% as if you repeated the same day many, many times, 10% of the time it would rain. No, because that day just appears, happens one time. Similarly, suppose a surgeon tells you that there is a 2% chance of complications in a particular surgery that you're considering taking. So it might mean that 2% of the patients that underwent surgery had complications. Okay, so that's 
that's that's a reasonable uh, meaning. But what does it mean to you, right? So, for instance, maybe most of the complications were with patients older than 90, and you're 35 years old. So it's really irrelevant for you, right? So this 2% just doesn't mean anything for you. OK? So this uh, leads us to the other type of uh, probability that has to do with uh, confidence, with measuring evidence, and basically quantifying uh, opinions. OK, so if we go back to before 1650, there was this word probable, people used it, um, uh, but its meaning was not quantitative. But even today, if you say this is probable or probably, um, it doesn't have any quantitative meaning. Here's the meaning that you find in the Webster Dictionary. Um, Insofar as seems reasonably true or factual or to be expected or without much doubt. Right? So all of these things, they are just basically saying probably means very likely. It is very likely to happen, or I'm pretty sure it will happen. Right? So that's, that's um, a very common, but unrelated to mathematics, unrelated to games of chance. So one term that was used before the 1650 that is kind of shows how this word probable uh, was, was used is that there was a term called probable doctor. And uh, what, what it uh, meant was that um, when you say that someone is a probable doctor, it meant that this doctor was approved by some authority. Okay, so probable just means um, approved um, by, by some, in some way. And approved uh, meant that um, the, in, at that time in Europe, it meant simply the church. The church said that this is an approved doctor, right? So, so that meaning of probably was really very different than what we intuitively think about today. Today, MDs are approved also. They're approved by a board. And after they do the board exam, then they're approved. And they're a good doctor, or they're an approved doctor, or the board certified doctor. So we're actually not that different from back then even though we use different words. Okay, so let's think about um, the, kind of, the kind of problems that are faced by a doctor. So if you want to diagnose a patient, it requires putting together many different pieces of information. Okay, so this is a little diagram that gives you uh, different types of information that goes into uh, the diagnosis, the patient interview, physical exam, medical history, medical tests. And most of the information is uncertain, right? You don't really know um, exactly um, what, is, what is the, what is the uh, blood content of a person. You know for a particular sample, it might change from day to day. And also, different pieces of information have different levels of relevance. Right? It might not be very relevant, the, the results of the blood test, or it might, the x-ray might reveal a lot, or the MRI might reveal very little. Okay? So when you're in this situation, you have information coming from different places. And with each piece of information, you somehow want to associate um, the confidence that, that, that you have. Now, the doctor does this, by and large, intuitively. But um, the, 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 this kind of, 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 of um, problems appear all over, and not just uh, in medicine. So when we talk about combining um, evidence, we are talking about things that are central to medicine, to economics, investment, law, science, technology, many, many different things that, are, that rely on basically combining evidence. And if they want to do it quantitatively, then they use probability and statistics. OK, and typically, you don't repeat an experiment many times. So in some very particular situations, you do. But in most of um, the important decisions that you're faced or uh, a doctor is faced, they, 
have this one patient that they need to treat. So there's no meaning to saying really what's the probability of something. Okay, so the math of this is provided by probability theory, but much of the discussion around it is not mathematical. So it is really discussion that has to do with convincing and with how do you compare this evidence to another evidence. Some of it is math and much of it is discussion. And that's the type of things that you get in statistics. You don't get really cut and dry um, outcomes. A popular approach to putting all of this in a very common framework is Bayesian statistics. So Bayesian statistics puts it as its main thing how to evaluate evidence and how to combine evidence. And it is not, it doesn't take the same approach as frequentist, even though fundamentally they use the same math. Okay, so that's basically the, the rough uh, introduction I started with. And uh, there are more details in this um, image here. And in a future video, I will go with you through this image and tell you some more of the details. Thank you.